I'd like to start by praying, Father, in the name of Yeshua, I lift up uh, this time. I, I want to honor you and thank you for this Sabbath, and I pray, Father, that you would speak and that you would use uh, this body uh, to pour out what it is that you have and that you would like to share with your people. Father, your word says that we overcome the enemy by our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. And so I just, again, I, I pray that uh, anyone that, that, that can hear my voice this morning and anybody that hears this testimony, uh, that you would use it to activate things, Father. That you would use it to bring reminders of dreams and visions, maybe that you've given or that you want to give. I pray, Father, that you would activate spirit-to-spirit -spirit encounters with you like you did with Solomon. And just like in the book of Job in 33, you said that you unlock the instructions upon our hearts in the nighttime. And Father, I also pray that as this testimony is shared, that you would speak clearly about the next steps and what it is that we are to be doing individually, but also corporately and also as a family. Father, I lift up the assembly of called out believers. I thank you for each and every person uh, that you have drawn to this place. Father, I pray that you would continue to use this place as a tool where people can grow, where people can heal. Uh, Father, I pray your continued wisdom, your continued understanding. Father, your continued discernment um, and all that are here. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you would draw every person that you have called to this assembly. And I pray, Father, for every person that's walked away out of pride that's supposed to be here, that you would heal, restore, and return. I pray, Father, that this would be a place where a person could be themselves. I pray that this would be a safe place, Father where a person could share their heart, where they could share their struggles, where they could share their trauma. And it'd be a place where they could come and they would know that they're not being judged, but truly loved. And that's what I love so much about this place is you just, you feel that spirit when you're here. You feel your presence, Father, and a true care and concern that you have that manifests through the people that are here. I thank you for every plan and purpose that you have for this congregation, Father. I pray for every plan and purpose, and I thank you for its outreach, Father, through the, through the Internet and through YouTube and through Facebook. And um, I pray, Father, for the, the leadership, those that are on the board or serving in that capacity, Father, that you would come and get, that you would give them wisdom and discernment and clear direction. Father, you say that you're the one that orders our pathway. And so I pray that would be the case for here. I pray, Father, for uh, divine counsel. I pray, Father, for provision for this place to accomplish the desires of your heart. I pray, Father, this morning for just attentive hearts. I pray that you would open our spiritual ears, open our spiritual eyes, so that we could hear what the Ruach HaKodesh is saying. Have your way, Father. Have your way in us. Father, I pray you would heal just for your namesake. It's not about us, Father, and that you would glorify yourself. I pray, Father, that you would manifest yourself by the Ruach HaKodesh, that we could walk and we could actually see and do the greater things that you actually spoke of that we would see and do. And bless each family that's here, Father, with the occupation that you have them in. And I just pray for your angelic host to be encamped about each person. You have an assignment for every human being. Father, that you have created. And I pray we would seek you diligently for that and that we would allow you and that we would posture ourselves in humility before you and that we would give you access to every part of our lives. That your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, good morning and Shabbat Shalom. It's an honor to be here at Assembly of Called Out Believers. My name is Paige. 
Roland, I'm very thankful for the invitation that was granted to me to come and share uh, the Father's testimony and just a few bits and pieces of uh, his heart along the way for the last eight years or so I've been on the road and I have met some wonderful people including uh, those that are here. So, back in 2007 I was given my first prophetic dream. I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit in June of 2006 that I won't get into the details there but everything in my life changed. It was I guess you could say an activation of sorts in my life and some pretty supernatural uh, things started happening and it started with dreams that's just that's a major way that he has chosen to speak to me and to reveal uh, to me and others you know what it is that he's doing in this earth he's very active and I'm, I'm sure there are those of you that are here um, that have active dream life you know as well and uh, how serious we are to take those and uh, also to be able to discern uh, the interpretations that are his because the, the word says the dreams are his and so are the interpretations so I find it quite fascinating that uh, he chose to start doing uh, that in my life to give me direction and then you know just to reveal maybe some of the things he's doing in this earth so uh, I'll start by sharing the first dream that I had was in September of 2007 and in this dream I, I walk down a set of stairs and when I get to the bottom of the stairs I take a left and I walk up another set of stairs onto a huge stage. It was about the size of this room actually. And I walk to where I'm about five steps in front of the stage and I'm peering out to uh, what looks like probably about a football size field. And in this field, in a horseshoe shape, all the way from left all the way around were what I discern then as people groups. And they were from all different origins from countries all over the world. And so starting off to the left, I might have seen some Scottish, some Irish going around, Chinese, some from African countries, Australia. I mean, it just it kept going all the way around. And they were sitting in groups of about five to seven people. And so as I recognized that in the horseshoe, um, all of a sudden there were two spotlights that came in and they're shown upon the very center of this horseshoe and it was all the Native American tribes, the indigenous people or First Nations, you know, as I've learned that they are called as well. And I knew that that was to be my focus or where I needed to put my attention. And so when I recognized that, all of a sudden there was a woman that stood up and I knew that she was about 35 years of age. She had long dark black hair and I knew that she was Apache. She was of the Apache tribe. I knew that she was a warrior. And anyway, so as I recognized that, she walks up towards me and off to the left of me, probably 10 or 15 feet, she lays prostrate. She just lays flat down and she begins to intercede. And so she's praying and as she prays, I start to feel I can discern what it is that she's praying as it's going to the Father. And I don't know how to describe that, but I just, I could feel the cry of her heart. I could feel the intention of her prayer was a cry to the Father for him to act, for him to do something on her behalf and on behalf of the Native American people, but also those that were in this horseshoe. And so as she's praying, I also could discern and I also felt the Father's heart because as she was praying, I was peering out and looking at all these people Nobody was really paying attention to what was going on in the intercession. All the groups of five to seven people or so, they were doing their own thing. They had their own governments going, they had their own religion going, you know, their own ideas. Nobody was really together, everybody was separate. And I could feel the Father's heart and the anguish that he had when he peered out. I mean, as I look out upon uh, this sea of people, the division that was there. And I know that that just breaks the Father's heart. So. Anyway, after she prays for a little bit, she stands up and she comes over and she kneels down and she actually, she grabs me around like the middle of my calves and near my knees and she looks up at me and she says, Paige, if we are not united, we are all going to perish. And then I helped her up. She stood up like this and then we stood together side by side. She takes a microphone off of this microphone stand, hands it to me. Then I just began to intercede like she was doing. And we were interceding together, praying against the things that were not unifying uh, the father's family. So that was the end of that dream. And I woke up from that and the father spoke really clearly to me. He said, you need to get several journals. And he said, dream, dreams are the main way that I'm going to speak to you and to bring revelation about what it is that you need to see and what it is that I've called you to do. So I do that and do what he says. And um, 
before I tell you this next part, you have to know that I absolutely love airplanes. I love helicopters, um, anything that flies, basically anything that will uh, transport. I spent a lot of time in a place called Temple, Texas. It was the place I left when he called me away back in uh, 2010. But that was kind of like my sanctuary. I would spend time at the airport and I would watch things take off and land. And I mean, it was, it was just amazing. So he was setting things up in Temple, Texas for me. Well, um, I began to pray. I just felt the tug that I wanted to do what I saw this lady doing in the dream. So I literally lay in the middle of my, the middle of the floor in my living room and I just start seeking the Father. I'm like, okay, she was praying this way. I want to learn how to pray. I want to learn how to intercede. You know, would you teach me? And I'm not there long and he speaks to me and he says, I want you to go to the airport. There's something that I need for you to do. So I'm like, cool, another chance to go to the airport. So I head to the Temple Airport and there was a spot that I would always sit in between two fences. And it obviously it gave me a view of uh, the biggest runway that was at the airport. So I get out there that day and I guess you could say my first test um, from him was coming because as I stood there and I looked out on the runway, he speaks to me and he says, I want you to lay prostrate on your face like your friend the Apache and I want you to praise and worship me. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't, man. There's people, there's, there's cars, there's, you know, windows. People will see me, they'll, they'll think I'm sick. You know, somebody will call an ambulance. You can imagine the things that are going on in my mind as he's asked me to do this, but I end up doing what he says to do. And so I lay prostrate in the middle of this parking lot I'm not even really praying to him. I'm thinking of myself saying, please don't let anybody see me. Hurry, do what you have to do, please. And, but anyway, he speaks pretty quickly and he says something really strange to me. Um, he says to me, I want you to get up. And he said, I want you to go pick up the two sticks. And he said, there's only two. And he said, there's one along each of the fences. And so I'm like, okay, really weird, but I'm gonna see if, if this is him speaking. So I get up and I go along the first fence and sure enough, I get about 50 feet down the uh, fence and there's a stick. It's about a foot and a half long and about a 50 cent piece size in, in diameter. And I'm kind of shaking my head and I'm thinking as I'm walking back to the center, there's no need for these sticks to be there because there's no trees at this airport. I mean, things are just going through my head. I'm like, this is crazy. So I get back to the center and I actually start walking down uh, the other fence and I come across a, another stick and it's exactly the same size. And so he was right, there was only two and they were both the same size. So anyway, I, I go back to the center of the fence as he instructs me and I just said, what am I supposed to do? Then he said, I want you to bring these two sticks together and ask me to unite my people. So I just said, Father, in the name of Jesus, as I, as I knew his name then, unite your people. And that was it. And I felt, you know, like, like I was finished with that assignment. So I drove away from the airport that day, kind of shaking my head. I'm like, it's cool. You know, it's obvious it was you, but, it, you know, I mean, it was really weird. I didn't want to tell anybody, you know, because I, they probably think I was crazy. But I did. I ended up telling a couple of people that were actually pretty encouraging. And um, so anyway... Uh, I get home and that night, um, about, this was at three in the morning. At three in the morning, I sit straight up in my bed and I yell out of my mouth as loud as I can, Kingdom Resource Network. And I see in front of me three golden letters, a K and an R and an N. And I had no idea what it meant. He just said, write it down. And he said, this will be important for the days of the end. I'm like, okay. So I just, I wrote down what he said. Um, I went back to sleep and he woke me up at four. I mean, this is literally like, like 35 minutes later, I'm up and he tells me to go out to my living room, to my couch and to seek him. So I'm up, I go out to the couch, I sit down and I just said, Father, what's on your heart? And the only thing that he said to me was the name Ezekiel. And you have to understand, I'm a fairly new Christian, you know, at, at this point. And I knew Ezekiel was a book in the Bible, but I didn't you know, understand completely what it is that he was wanting to reveal to me. So I start going through. And so for the next three nights, he's waking me up at 4 a.m. <coughs> Excuse me. And I finally get to the 37th chapter. And you all in here are familiar with, with that. I mean, it's talking about Israel, the dry bones. And I get down to the 15th verse. And I knew that the verses 15 through 28 were going to be uh, the very verses of the walk that I had. The very thing that he had called me to do was going to be all about uniting um, the two sticks. And so the first stick, and I'm thinking of the two that he had me pick up at the airport, uh, where it says in, in verse 15, it says, write upon it the name of 
you know, Ephraim and then the other one right upon it, the name of Judah, and bring those two together, one in your hand. And that was a symbolism of him. So I'm really excited. And it wasn't so much the act of actually doing that. I mean, that was kind of cool and funky, but it was to understand that I heard his voice. That was such a, a, a boost for me in confidence, knowing that it's like, oh my gosh, man, the creator of all things speaks to his people today. Then he wants to speak to each and every one of us. It's not just Paige or anybody. I mean, his whole creation, he wants to have interaction with us. And he does speak, but the question is, do we listen? Have we found out the ways that he actually wants to speak? You know. So anyway, I encourage you to seek that out. So. I'm really encouraged when uh, this happens and more dreams start coming. Uh, this is chronological, so that ends 2007. In 2008, I'm in a small room with three other people. There's four of us, and I've never had an experience like this since, and I hadn't had one until then, but it was like the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, blanketed the room. And all I can tell you is that there was a massive amount of peace, and we knew that the Father was up, up to something. Well, a friend that I was with, um, has a gift to where when the father wants to show something to him, he will actually plop out a movie or a projector screen in front of him and he'll actually play a movie. And so this day for two hours we sat and we listened to Steve talk about the movie that was being played out in front of his face. And it just happened to be about the things that were going to be happening in America from that time you know, until whatever the last thing he saw takes place. So I just feel led to share just a couple of things because they're pivotal to uh, the testimony that he has me walking in. Um, he started describing what he saw and he said he saw a two by three foot uh, map. And he said inside of this map, he could see a bunch of different colors of, you could say yarn or string. And they were all together and they actually made up the makeup of this map. But he said the color that stuck out the most were the fibers and threads that were black. And he said that's what he knew he had to pay attention to when he was walking. So when he understood that this two by three map represented the United States, all of a sudden off to the east, and he didn't say where, but off to the east there was a flash. There was a flash of light and he just knew that it was a disturbance of some kind. And so when this disturbance happened, when that flash of light happened, he said that he saw the black threading actually rise up out of the rest of the colors and out of the fabrication of the map. And when that took place on the east coast, it turned into a forearm. And then the hand portion actually turned into a Tyrannosaurus rex. And so when that happened, it looked like the Tyrannosaurus Rex had peered out looking to the east like it was going to go out and attack, you know, what that disturbance or that flash of light was, but it was a false flag. It looked like it pretended like it was going out, but it actually came back and it starts devouring within the United States. And so, I mean, he's saying this stuff and I mean, I'm sitting there, my eyes are like this big and it's like, what? you know, what's going on? Well, after that, he starts saying that he sees major cities within the United States, particularly uh, New York, LA, um, a few things like that from what I discerned from what he was saying, um, were devastated. And uh, something happened within those places uh, where life could no longer, you know, be sustained. And so there were people looting, there were people robbing breaking into grocery stores, breaking into whatever they could and taking anything of value, food, the food was gone with like within two days. I mean, it was done, done deal. And so this caused basically all the people that are in the inner cities to start to go out into the more rural areas. And so after um, he was saying this, he said that we could no longer use the highways, the major thoroughfares like I-35 or I-5 or you know I-90 or whatever it was, that these were now property of the state and they were being policed heavily and so there were those not part of the state or not connected to that somehow who were for a time could move on roads but they were back roads and you could only do that for a period of time and after that he said he saw um, a family that was actually going through the woods I mean, they were like hopping from tree to tree being very careful being very strategic in their maneuvers to get to um, what he was saying was a place of refuge or a city of refuge. And so this family gets up to this door, knocks on it. Uh, the door is opened. Um, they say a password and they're able to go in. Well, after that, they actually go underground um, to where they find sustenance. There was food, there was water, there was clothing, um, a place a person could lay their head down, get restored, you know, for whatever, not to stay there necessarily, but to get what they needed and refreshed and to get out of there and to go, you know, do what the father was calling them to. And so, 
There was more and more. I'm just I'm going to stop at that part because that's enough. The place of refuge piece is, was the key component that um, I, I needed to share here today. Um, and understanding that, you know, we had no idea, and we were asking ourselves, we weren't, I've never really been into eschatology until about five years ago, or looking into the end times or the book of Revelation or the Apocrypha and what those things mean. I mean, we, we have an understanding now of how important that stuff is, but being new Christians and getting this revelation and not understanding it, um, it was quite eye-opening, as you can imagine. And it's like, how in the world does America get from that point that we saw it early in 2008 to what it is that he was saying and what it is that he saw. And so obviously we start looking into Revelation and we start, you know, studying Noah and the very first scripture that pops out, you know, pretty much to me going through this process was, I think it's Matthew, it's either 24 or 25, but it says, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. And looking at that and it's like, okay, how do we get to that point from where we were in 2008? Well, you've seen the milestones and the markers. Uh-oh. You see the milestones and the markers of uh, what is transpiring as we head more and more towards that point where there's literally, you know, he's got his people, but there's also nothing but evil, you know, in the earth. And so you're seeing basically developing, and I'll talk a little bit later about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, which, which the enemy is doing everything he can to make that come to full life. And we're getting closer and closer to um, that time. So... Uh, more dreams were coming. Uh, the Father started sending Steve and I to the East Coast, and we actually started meeting people um, through connections, basically, that he had um, because of what it was that he was seeing. And anyway, sorry, sorry for this. Anyway, um, we started meeting people that had acres upon acres of land. Um, they had houses, they had apartment complexes, they had different places that the father was actually setting aside for um, times of the end. And so these were places that people were preparing. Um, and at the time, as we understood it then, it was for Jewish people. It was like people that were Christians that were preparing this land that when everything hit the fan, that there were going to be safe places for these people to come. And that was kind of, a, I guess, maybe a picture that you saw the family that was going into that safe place and going down and, and being safe. Well, greater understanding has, has come from that, and, and we'll get to that. But we started meeting people that felt that they had to grow food uh, because the food in the end days was going to be no good. It was actually the food that the government was giving people was actually going to destroy their DNA, that somehow they were going to be able to use that as coding that was going to be written you know, upon our DNA, and the more and more that we ate of it, the sicker and sicker we got, which would cause more and more pharmaceuticals to be taken and passed out, which then would make us even more sick, requiring more pharmaceuticals. And so there was this cycle of insanity that was beginning to open and that we were beginning to understand, you know, and see that there, there was a clear line now that was being drawn between, you know, good and evil. But understanding that and actually having um, the discernment and the wisdom to be able to see, you know, what it was. Because I still today, I, I love to eat and, you know, bite into a Pop-Tart or, you know, to eat popcorn or I love Wendy's, you know, a double cheeseburger with fries and a Frosty. Are you kidding me? There's nothing better. But it's one of the worst things that we can do actually now to our bodies. And so the reason that I say that is that there are people all over the world um, that have been growing non-GMO food and that have been preparing for the days ahead uh, for when we may not be able to buy. And so, anyway, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Two, that was pretty much 2000 and 2000, sorry, 2008, 2009. In 2010, um, on 10, 10, 10, I was in bed again, four o'clock in the morning, and I hear four thuds, bam, 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 bam. And it sounded like somebody was trying to kick in my door. And so anyway, I lift my head up off of the pillow, and immediately I knew that there wasn't anybody at the front door, but that it was Yah. It was God that was getting my attention, and I knew that it was Him that was knocking and saying, Paige, it's time. Don't know what that was, but usually I get up and I would go to the couch. Well, I didn't this time. I actually put my head back down on the pillow. So as I laid my head back down on the pillow, 
I either went into an immediate dream or a type of vision, whether it was a night vision or whatever, but all I can tell you is that I'm standing with my ex-wife and we are walking in a field together. We're walking down this path. As we get to a certain point, she pulls away from my hand and starts walking towards this table with doctors and nurses that are sitting at it. Um, and I stop. And when I actually stop, I turn to the left. And when I turn to the left, I start jumping up and down. And it was shouts of joy and exuberance and thanking the Father because I knew that what he was revealing to me or what I was seeing was what he has called me to do. I knew that that, what I was looking at, and that knock symbolized that this is, he was revealing to me what it is that he has created me to be a part of. So I'm jumping up and down. Well, after I see this, um, I wait, oh, let me tell you the other part that's in there. There's, uh, next to me is a, a little white building with the red number 12 on it. And there's a huge foundation next to it about, I don't know, a half a football field and solid concrete. And on this concrete are four brand new Apache helicopters. And I knew that they were brand new because they had plastic on the rotors in the back and also on the top. I just, I knew that they were new. So I wake up from that and I'll never forget, well, I won't even go into that part um, because it doesn't matter. I just, I got up and immediately went to the couch and I just said, Father, what is this? What is going on? Can you tell me about this? And so there's like three critical things that have happened up to this point or four or whatever. Uh, but the dream with the Apache woman, you know, and the unity, you've got the two sticks, the two sticks coming together. Um, you've got the thing with America, something's going to happen to America that's going to cause uh, some things that aren't so wonderful. But the great news is, is that he is who he is and he's created us for such a time as this and he's going to glorify his name no matter what. And then on 10, 10, 10, now all of a sudden there's four brand new Apache helicopters on this foundation next to a building with a red number 12. Father, that's a lot. What does this mean? What is this all about? What are you doing? What are you up to? And I start looking at the number 12, you know, foundationally, and I'm not a gematria guy or whatsoever, but people are telling me the number 12 is symbolic to the tribes of Israel. Uh, it's a governmental number. It's important for that. Um, the red means kind of an urgency, um, the blood, you know, and several things like that, a foundation. He is laying and has poured, and he's, he's raising up an apostolic foundation um, that he is developing and that he can move forward with his government and his people. And so I'm really excited about the Apaches. I was in the military. I actually wanted to be an Apache pilot. That didn't happen. Um, but anyway, they're, they're incredible machines. They're the firepower on this. I mean, they're, they're very versatile and the things that they can do, they're lethal. And so there's a correlation with that the Apaches themselves, but the two sticks, but then also the Apache or the Native Americans, you know, in the dream that I saw. And so all of this somehow is together, but I don't quite understand, you know, what that means. And so uh, getting into 2011, um, must have been March, March 15th, I want to say it was, uh, right around that time, it was a uh, uh, Friday afternoon, I'm sitting in my office dressed very casually. I worked uh, locally uh, in the community of Temple um, in the Chamber of Commerce uh, in the realm of a little bit of economic development and, and was a big proponent of pulling people for a bigger vision together in Temple. So I was actually kind of doing in the natural, you know, what I was doing in the uh, Father was going to show in the Spirit. So um, anyway, I'm sitting, my boss comes down to my office one day. And like I said, this is on the 15th. It was a Friday. And he looks into my office and he brings a, a folder and he sets it on my desk and he said, can you extrapolate this information and get it ready for the next board meeting? And I said, sure. Well, he sits down and he says, Paige, how are you? And out of my mouth, I didn't plan on this. I didn't pray for this. But all I can tell you is out of my mouth comes Berdan, who is my boss next month in April. It's my last month working here and for you. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't ever happen. So we just kind of looked at each other with, you know, mouths open and we're like, oh my gosh. And, but he pretty much blesses me in a way that I never expected, especially after saying what I had just said, because he looks at me and he said, I knew it. He said, I knew something was going on. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He said, enlighten me, because I didn't, you know. And he said, Paige, you can tell. He said, we love your heart. You do a great job. Your heart is for God. He said, you've got to do what he tells you to do. And he literally gives me a high five. He says, have a nice day. And he walks out of my office. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. 
So then I actually go home and I, I share then with my wife, I share with my parents, I share with my friends. And you can imagine uh, what took place. It was not a happy time in Paige's life. And I can tell you that the rest of March and all of April were absolute hell. Excuse my language, but that's, that's what it was like. I no longer had support from anybody in my family, nor did I have that support from many of the people that were Christian friends. So I was kind of, I did feel alone, you know, obviously. And not that that matters. I mean, we know that he's always with us, but he took me through a process of basically 40 days of having to completely trust him and him revealing and him confirming. And he told me he was going to confirm what it is that he was asking me to do. And so I've got pastors coming and telling me, you're irresponsible. You cannot do this. That's not God. That, you know, da 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 da. And that's the stuff coming from family. It's like, am I crazy? You know, you've got to think to yourself. It's like when God asks you to do something and it goes against the mainstream, it goes against and kicks against the goads of leadership and Christianity or whatever you want to call it, you're going to get backfire. You're going to get it. And this gentleman back here, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 40 days later, so we get to April 28th, which is a Thursday, and April 28th was the day before my last day on a Friday in April. Go to work. We have a Bible study every week on Thursdays from 12 to 1. Go to that Bible study. Well, today is kind of cool. The gentleman I told you that had the vision of America brings with him that day a gentleman that's probably about this tall or so. And anyway, he's got a cool looking colorful kippa on. And he's got a satchel that's very large and it's purple. And anyway, so he sits down and he was gonna share his testimony that day. Well, he pulls out two shofars. And anyway, he puts these shofars up to his mouth and he goes like that. Two different songs and sounds came out. And I mean, I'm just like, every hair on my body was like standing up and I'm like, oh man, something just happened by the spirit. Something, something happened. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, you know who he is, yes. So I look at this guy and um, I'm blown away. Well, he sits down and he starts telling his testimony and gets going in it and he stops like halfway through it and he points across the table at me and he says, you. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you need to know that my life scriptures, Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. And I'm just like, oh, you're kidding, right? And he's like, no. And he's like, it's important for you too. So that was the beginning of a little bit of peace, you know, coming back because tomorrow's, you know, tomorrow's a day. So anyway, when he gets done doing that, he's sharing his testimony that the father speaks to me by his spirit and says, I want you to take him to the airport. And I'm like, okay. So we make plans uh, for this gentleman uh, and my friend and I to meet out at the airport in Temple. And we set up a time for four o'clock. So I'm out there about a quarter to, well, I'm there 30 minutes before. And anyway, time is ticking and I'm praying and I'm nervous and I'm like, Father, what's going on? Why are you calling him out here? What, what is it? Quarter to four comes and uh, the guys aren't here. 10 to four, the guys aren't here. And I'm like, Father, what is going on? Five to four, the guys aren't here. And I'm like, what is going on? He says, look up. And so I look up, you know, and I'm looking to the north, standing at the airport, and I see four Apache helicopters flying from the north and coming south towards me. And I look at it, and I just kind of shake my head for a second, and I'm thinking, could it be? You know, could, could this be the dream? And I kind of get excited, and I'm like, no, they're probably, you know, they'll veer this way or go that way or whatever. And then all of a sudden, as I'm looking at them, here comes the two gentlemen to come to a halt. Robert, the guy jumps out of the, the car, he's got his shofars, and he's like, you guys, you guys, you guys, he says, something's happening by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, <clears throat> and he says it has everything to do with these four Apache helicopters. He didn't say four Apaches, I'm sorry, he said the four helicopters that are coming this way. And so, my other friend is standing next to me, and he's kind of hitting me on the shoulder like this, and he's saying, Paige, he said, it's your dream. This is your dream, this is your dream. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't know. And I'm thinking, you know, they're going to come, and so they do land, but they're, heck, you know, a couple hundred yards off on a different runway altogether. And so I'm like, well, they're just going to fly away. Well, they, they don't, and they're not hovering. They're taxiing on their wheels. They taxi all the way to where they're literally from me to where this camera is or where Nick is sitting 
are these four Apache helicopters. And they have come in and, and anyway, so they're going full power. Well, they start to wind down. He shuts them down to where they're just barely moving like this. And I'm beside myself. I mean, I'm kind of speechless. I'm just looking at these things like, oh my gosh, what is going on? Well, um, the friend with the shofars uh, looks at Steve and I and he says, I'm getting some, some stuff from the father. He says, this is very significant governmentally. And he says, this has everything to do with military. And he said, I'm supposed to play two songs, one for the Israeli military and one for the United States. Have at it. <laughs> do what you got to do. So he puts the shofars to his mouth. And he begins to play one for the United States and then the one for the... Well, when he starts and the, the music comes out of the shofars, these Apache helicopters fire back up to where they're going full throttle um, with the rotors. And anyway, they start following each other in a circle. I have witnesses. I know you think I'm weird right now, but this really happened. Um, they're going in a circle like this, round and round, while he's playing the music. And the father keeps speaking to my heart, covenant government covenant government and he just keeps saying that over and over while Robert is playing these songs and I'm like okay so he gets finished at playing the songs and the Apaches actually uh, veer out they start taking off uh, towards the north taxiing and then within two or three minutes they actually fly away well Robert gets uh, he feels he's got another word from the father and he looks at me and he says Paige he said you and I will be in uh, Jerusalem will be in Israel together on a prophetic prayer assignment of some kind very soon. And I just said, that's great. And he said, one other thing that I'm supposed to do. He said, you're supposed to stand over here next to these two fences, which granted, he knew nothing about the dream. He knew nothing about the two sticks. He had no idea you know, who I was or what, what had been happening. And he says, I'm to take these shofars and blow them. And he said, I'm to march around you seven times. And he said, that's it. And then he said, I feel like we're released and we can go. So Anyway, he does that. He grabs his staff out of his truck, hands it to me, and holds it out. He blows his shofars, and he marches around me seven times. And I'm watching these Apache helicopters take off. And it's the greatest day of my life. I mean, the Father has just confirmed, not only through that amazing dream, but he actually made that dream come to pass. And I forgot to mention, when he was blowing the shofars, I, I stood back and I looked, and these helicopters are in the exact position that they were in the dream on that concrete pad next to a little white building with the red number 12 that had just been painted, and it had to have been done in the last two days because it wasn't there. So it was a freshly painted number 12. So anyway, those guys take off, and I'm literally doing what I was doing in the dream. I mean, I'm jumping up and down, just praising him and thanking him, and, you know, this is awesome. and. You know, that's great. And then I'm thinking in my head, <laughs> what does this mean? I don't understand. What are you doing? So I get back home and I'm thinking that this is going to be, um, this is going to be the restoration point. Because once I tell this story to my wife and family and friends, everybody certainly is going to say, wow, Paige, you know, sorry. Or <laughs> let's at least work through that. It got worse. When I told them all these, it made it just, it made it worse. Anyway, so... I get through the weekend, Monday morning comes around, and Paige kind of had a plan. I already kind of had in my heart that if he's calling me to some kind of ministry, then there's certain things I have to do. I've got to get a website, you got to get a 501c3, you need business cards, and then you need a plan to raise money. I mean, that's just, that was the Christian way that I was taught, that here's how you do it if you're going to go full-time ministry. So I start that process that Monday morning, and I think I got as far as actually making parts of a business card. And I'm sitting in the office by myself. My wife had left the day before, and she was gone for a few days on a business trip. And so when I'm doing this, he, he speaks, and he says, what are you doing? And I don't say anything with my mouth at all. I just, my thought back to him was, you know, I'm just thinking, I'm like, well, I'm helping you. You know, I'm helping you get this going, whatever it is that you're doing. And anyway, I just, I finally, I just said to myself, I'm like, no. I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have absolutely no clue. And he said, two things I require. He said, you have to go where I tell you to go. You have to do what I tell you to do. And you have to say what I tell you to say. I'm like, okay. And he said, the second thing is, he said, you can never ask anybody for a penny. And I was like, ah, oh, no. I'm like, that wrecked me. That totally wrecked me because I had a plan. And I also had just pretty much received the last paycheck, you know, that I was going to get. And I didn't have any support from my spouse or my family because everybody thought I was crazy and that Paige is going to have to go through this period of time where he learns his lesson. And so I had nothing. And so the father starts speaking to me and he tells me a couple of things that I'm going to be doing. And I have to completely put my trust in him and rely on him for 
provision. Well, this has been eight years. And the Father has sent me, sent me to many different places and many things, and He has provided exactly what I've needed when I've needed it. And I'm so thankful, um, you know, for the journey that He's allowed me to walk in uh, to get to this point, I guess you could say, level of, of trust. I don't know about faith. I still need a whole lot more faith, but um, trusting in the money thing. So um, for the next three days, I kind of stewed and hemmed and hawed, and I'm like, Father... I don't know how you do this. I don't know what you're asking me to do. I don't understand these things. And so Thursday, I get a phone call, and on the other end of the phone is a lady by the name of Rosemary Schindler. And you've heard of Schindler's List. So anyway, she is a lady that uh, had a mutual friend that, that blew the two shofars. And so she's on the phone. She says, Paige, she said, we have a mutual friend. She said, you guys had a crazy experience in Temple with, with these helicopters and with the shofars and da-da-da-da-da. And he said, I'm calling you today because I, I feel like there's a couple of things that I need to share. And, she said, and so she starts off and she says, I've, I've taken on the, miss, the mission of Oscar. You know, the, the legacy has been passed down to me to take care of Holocaust survivors and to honor these families and, and you know, moving forward. So I'm like, that's incredible. And she said, but I want to tell you that I really feel, Paige, you're going to be uh, in Israel on 11-11-11. She says it's an important date prophetically, and she said, but you'll be there. And she said, you'll be connected to a few people, and you guys will be interceding, you know, with Robert in Jerusalem. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then she says to me, something really strange happened. She said, you received four Apache helicopters on April 28th at 2 o'clock. She said, or I'm sorry, at 4 o'clock. She said, I was in San Francisco. She said, it was 2 o'clock, my time. And she said, I was leading a group. She said, a group across the Golden Gate Bridge in a march, march of remembrance ceremony with Holocaust survivors. And she said, when we got to the halfway point, she said, she looked out, and there's an Apache helicopter hovering. And so I'm like, again, the hairs kind of go doing, doing. Okay, Father, you know, what's going on? And she said, I felt it was important. So she, when Robert told me what happened to you guys in Temple, Texas, she said, I knew it correlated with what, you know, the Father was doing with the Apache. And she said, it was just bizarre. She said, not so much that the helicopter was sitting there, but she said, it's what it did. And she said, that's what I have to tell you. I'm like, okay. She said, when I saw the Apache and recognized it, she said, I did. I happened to peer at my watch. She looked at it. And she said, but the helicopter could have easily just flown, you know, in between the, the, the golden gates that are there. And she said, but it dropped. And she said, it dropped at a very fast speed. And then she said, it shot underneath, you know, the bridge. And when she said that, it was like, it was like I got punched in the stomach, but in a good way. And I don't know how to explain that to you other than, boom, something happened. And I knew that it was something that I needed to hear when she said that. Well, after she said that, I got it. A piece of it not all of it there's still stuff I don't understand but I knew that everything up to this point that he had shown me regarding the two sticks regarding what my friend saw with uh, America regarding the Apache helicopters regarding the Apache praying for unity I knew that talking to Rosemary Schindler that there was going to be a Holocaust far greater than anything we could ever imagine I also knew that it was going to correspond with the greatest exodus so much so that we would not even remember the first. It's going to be the same as it was with the Holocaust. And I'm like, oh, this is about the protection of your people. These Apache helicopters represented intercession, represented these places of refuge, represented these places of worship when we gather here. Then the face of these things are changing. There's people in this world right now that cannot get together like we do. But I want to tell you what, they're moving heaven, they're rocking heaven, they're rocking spiritually a whole lot more than we are. Then I just have to be honest with you with that, because in this country we are still very apathetic. We are still very complacent. We're still so worried about ourselves. We're still worried about paychecks. We're still worried about trucks and boats and cars and houses and all these things trying to figure out this American dream. You can't even get 50 people to come together in a church anymore without some kind of division or somebody trying to take the helm saying, I'm prophet so-and-so or apostle blah, 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 and I'm leading the way. I don't mean to be sarcastic, but I'm telling you, the enemy is having a heyday within the realm of Yahweh, within the realm of Yahweh. We're fighting right now. We're fighting over the name. We're fighting over how to say it, how to say Yeshua, how to say Yehoshua. People are leaving. They're walking away from each other because I don't pronounce something the same way you do. They're walking away from each other because they can't use their gifts 
Every person has a gift and a calling. Every person. This isn't about one person leading the way. This is about people coming together and the Father being allowed to use His people in whatever he, way He says fit. The Father is tearing down the pedestals. The Father, I'm, I'm telling you, it has to. We've got to be able, and He's taking us and bringing us to a point where we are going to get together. And it's important that everybody is used, everybody's talents and gifts. Anyway, say la. Let that let that soak in. I don't know why I rabbit trailed there, but um, anyway, uh, at that point, um, I'm like, Father, what do you want me to do for the next few months? You know, until we go to Israel. Well, a door opens for me to, to be a part of starting a group where we would get together and we would just start praying. And so we did that. Well, the group grew big pretty quickly, so fast that we had to get another spot. And so we started praying. We asked for somebody to come forward. We're all of a sudden, we're partnering with the local Christian church. This is in Gatesville, Texas. And we get to the first meeting, so we're doing this once a month. We get to the second one. I'm away in Houston, um, and I get a call. Tragedy has, has happened in Gatesville. The, the wife of the pastor that was hosting us and allowing us to be in their facility, his wife is dead. And she died in a house fire. And so it's like, oh my gosh, well, you know, I'll get there, you know, as soon as I can. I'll, it'll be a couple of days. But then I start getting different phone calls coming from people that were in this congregation saying that there was foul play suspected. And I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, I, I start hearing things about, you know, the pastor from people that he was very close to that, you know, things like his truck made it, but hers didn't. His dog made it out alive, but hers didn't. All of his personal belongings got out, but hers didn't. And it was just funny. And so I'm kind of like shaking my head and I'm like, Father, what's going on? Well, this man is now, he's, he's in prison, you know, and it probably will be forever, you know, because he, he did not get charged and no, he got charged for murder, um, but he is now guilty and sitting in prison of first degree arson. They couldn't, they couldn't prove um, that he killed her. So I need to be careful about what I say and how I say it. But the, the man is in prison anyway. There's a full-blown cult in operation, so they discovered that, you know, he had taken out an insurance policy on his wife a few weeks prior to the fire. And also, uh, the board of this church knew full well that he was having an affair with a woman that was on the worship team who was also pregnant with his child. Within three days or four days of this happening, he already had another ministry going and they were meeting at a hotel two miles from the church, you know, that we're in. And so th this is a full-blown cult, you know, an operation. So it's like, I don't understand what this is. Well, I, so I, I go over and there's a woman and her husband that were there and she keeps, she has two dreams, two nights in a row consecutively saying, Paige, you were in the dream and it was you that came to help us. And I'm like, uh-uh, <laughs> not me. You know, I, I don't know how to do that. I'm not a pastor. I don't know how to, you know, do these. I, I, I'm not equipped, nor do I have the skill set to help anybody come out of what it is that you guys have just experienced. And so that we'll pray about it and just ask because we're pretty sure it's you. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's not. So I'm going to hop in the car and, and drive away. I was so angry. Then I just prayed and I said, Father, what is it of these dreams that you've given her? And truth is there to me being a part of helping. I don't want to walk away from him. I want to help him if, if that's the desire of your heart. And he says to me, this has nothing to do with you being a pastor. He said, I need to teach you some things. And I was like, okay. So, you know, I go back humbly and I just say, the Father spoke into my heart that I am to help you. What that looks like, I don't know. But anyway, he gave me some guidelines that I had to follow in eliminating pretty much the entire staff going away, but then this caused me to start seeking his face about where does defilement come from? Where does blood crying out come from? I was a New Testament guy. I'm Matthew for Revelation all the way. I didn't know anything about Genesis through Malachi. I had no idea. Bits and pieces like Ezekiel and some of the prophets. I loved reading that stuff, but the book of Leviticus in my eyes at that time was, was not valid. Not only that, I was teaching that. I was teaching you know, against his commandments. I was teaching against his feast days and his Sabbath. Not because I wanted to lead people astray. I was just ignorant. I had no idea. That verse of Jeremiah that says, your fathers have inherited lies. I was a byproduct of that generationally. And so that caused me to go back and look at, start seeing Cain and Abel and understanding where the blood cries out and going back and looking, you know, at the origin. And there was a hunger that was developing in me because 
I felt horrible that I, I wasn't able to discern that before or that I wasn't given the discernment and that maybe if you had, if, if you'd have spoken to somebody, maybe she'd be alive today and maybe something could have happened. You know the process you go through when someone loses their life or whatever. So we start going through the process and asking him and he was diligent in showing us how it was we needed to pray and what it is that we needed to do to get rid of the curses. Well, not only was it this gentleman, but there were four pastors prior to him that were a pastor of this very church who fell in some terrible debaucherous sin. And it's like, here I am coming into this, I'm freaking out. I'm like, I'm not a pastor. I'm not the pastor. I'm not going down, <laughs> you know, like these other people have. And it was prideful, but it was out of fear because I didn't understand. You've got a community of Gatesville. 15,000 of them are prisoners. Literally, it's a huge prison town. There's probably 10 churches, and everybody knows everybody. So, I mean, we were up against any and everything you can imagine. This church has been frowned upon for years. It was charismatic, blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, we kind of started from the ground up. Well, that introduces and opens the door for me to go to Israel. And the Father speaks very clear to me when I go that I'm not to proselyze. I'm not to speak the name of, of Jesus, and I'm not to share that with anybody that I encounter. And I'm thinking, God, that's a slap in the face. Why in the world? That's my passion, to tell people about, you know, who you are. And he's like, just don't do it. So I get over there. Um, they actually meet up with a Messianic group who I don't understand what Messianic is, but the Father starts the seed planting right then. And I meet with these people in New York. We go to Israel, go through 10 days of the tour. The Bible comes alive. Can't stop crying when we land because I know I'm home, but I don't understand why. Um, it was just beautiful. Got baptized in the, in the Jordan. And then assignment day comes, and Robert comes and picks me up with two uh, African-American people who called themselves Israelites. And I thought that was interesting. I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means, but that's cool. We end up going to a rooftop in Jerusalem, and the Father just lays out plans. He speaks to my heart, government, covenant, and he's given plans to, you know, the, the people that are there. Well, we end up at 11, 11 a.m. on 11, 11, 11 um, at Yad Vashem. That's the very first place we are with shofars. And we're praying and interceding, you know, there. And then we end up going to Netanyahu's, Perez's, uh, the UN. We go to uh, just different spots that he was telling. And we were just pouring out our hearts. And strategically, I'm not sure what that meant, but I knew that there was a lot of division. And I knew that there was a lot of division in me. I know, you know, driving away from there. Well, after this, the, the Father gives me basically three evenings uh, set apart to where I can go to a place called Sukkot Hillel. And House of Praise is what it's called. And it's a place that uh, David Writings uh, started quite a few years ago. But it overlooks the um, old city of David. And it's amazing. They do 24-7, uh, you know, prayer and worship there. There's constant music. There's constant prayer going out, you know, over that city. And so anyway, the Father says to me that I have a divine appointment for you. So I go, and I go for three nights, and it didn't happen. I was thankful to be there, and I did interact with people, but there was nothing divine about one meeting or, or meeting one person. So I get on the plane, and I fly back. And I get back to Texas, and I'm driving back to church one day, and I just said, man, I said, I, I never met the person um, that I felt, you know, you said I had a divine appointment with. And he said, just be patient. So I did. And so I get to the church, and within two days, um, I'm on my knees because he brings me to the scripture that says, many, uh, many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many. And I looked at that, and so I, I keep seeing that as people. To me, it was people like trying to grab people and lead them, saying that, you know, they're the Messiah and misleading and misguiding them. And he said, look at it again. So I looked at it again. It said, many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many. And I said, yeah, Father. And he said, right now that's you. And I mean, uh, what do you do with that? What do you do when the creator of all things tells you that you are misleading his people and he shows it to you in scripture? And it's like, I don't know what this means. I don't understand. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm on my knees, but I'm like, I don't know what it means. He said, you're teaching people against my ways. And I'm like, okay. And I got done sobbing and groveling. And anyway, I get up and he says, you're done. He says, you've learned what it is that I've needed to show you. Move on. So it was set up and it per worked perfectly. There was a people that came forward saying that they wanted to lead the way when they felt that it was time for me to step out. And so that happened. Well, I'm driving home that day, and he speaks something to me that I didn't think I'd ever hear. 
And he says to me, he says, I do not want you to return to church on Sunday. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I don't know why, but, but, I, but I, I'll honor that, Father. And he said, there is a specific reason why. And he says, it's important right now. And I said, okay. So I get home. And I'm like, okay. It basically set a time um, for me. I don't know if you're familiar with this or if, if, if you've had an opportunity when you're seeking the Father and He absolutely pulls you out of any and everything that you're involved in so that He can eliminate where you've been, so that He can actually start a process from scratch with you. That's where He was taking me, but I just didn't, I didn't understand it or why. And so anyway, uh, I'm, for two months, I'm hanging out, um, not going to church on Sunday. He didn't say Wednesday. So I went Wednesdays, you know, to, to some familiar churches. And what was interesting is when I did, um, it was a place in Waco, and it was called the Olive Branch Church. And the first couple of times that I went there, the first time I walked in the door, and the pastor of the place looks at me, and he comes up, and he says, I have great news for you. And I'm like, okay, what's that? He said, I see you surrounded with Jewish people. And he said, you're going to Israel many, many times. And he said, it's really important for you to understand their customs, their ways. And he said, particularly the Sabbath and their feasts. And he's saying there. I mean, listen to the words. And I'm like, huh? I'm like, okay. I mean, I've got peace about it or whatever, but it doesn't make sense because... I'm asking people, I'm like, the direction, I'm telling them. I'm like, listen, I can't go to church on Sundays. What's, what is this? Well, just don't go back to Sabbath, you know, because that's, that's the wrong way. And so I'm still in my mind, you know, thinking of those things. But I also know that he's chastised me because I've led people away from it. So I'm in this bout of confusion of like, which way do I go? And anyway, he's using people to speak to me. Well, there were other people that would come up to me and just in the middle of the street in the middle of the day, um, that would tell me that they saw a tallit on me, or they saw me wearing tzitzits, or that I was, you know, celebrating the, the Sabbath and shaking my head and just receiving all this, you know, with joy. I'm like, fantastic, you know, that's great. And anyway, he, he sets it up to where I go to Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And anyway, so I get up there. Well, it's a house of prayer. It's a Grand Traverse house of prayer. And on a Friday night, this gentleman was speaking. His name was, oh my gosh, I forget his name. It's important. It'll come to me. Ah, I forget. Anyway, so he's speaking. He's talking about Israel, and he's talking about what I was telling you, Sukkot Hillel, the house of prayer, and how he and this uh, Mr. Writings gentleman, uh, 10 years at that time, which this is 2012, um, started that ministry in the old city of David. And I'm like, that's it. I'm like, that's the divine appointment. That's who I'm supposed to meet. Well, we get to know each other. I show him pictures, and he said, sure enough, and um, Nigel Lydiard is his name. Thank you, Father. And we're, so we're back at his house, and anyway, he just starts, he starts getting a prophetic word, and he looks at me, and he says, Paige, he said, I don't understand this. He said, it's really weird, but he said, I see Yeshua standing behind you, and he's got a Hanukkah, or a Hanukkah, the nine-branched, not the menorah, but the nine-branched candle. So he said, he's standing behind you, and he's shoving it in your back, and he said, that's your new spine. And I'm like, yeah, that's really weird, you know? So I just said, I'll write it down. And he said, yeah, write that down and go back and just, you know, pray about that. So I did. I get home. I look up Hanukkah. Well, the stuff of the Maccabees comes up, you know, and then, but also Hanukkah or um, Hanukkah. Yeah, but I look up the word and it actually means dedication or rededication. And I'm like, that's it. I'm like, I knew that this spine or whatever it is that he was going to have me walking in was all about rededication to him or a dedication and so I'm like okay that brings a lot of peace so more and more was coming um, this was the kicker this this changed this next trip changed my life uh, forever and I had a dream that I was going to Colorado to Ohio and then back to Texas well for a couple of years I had been in June in the month of June meeting uh, at my sister's with my son and family and this is in Lafayette Colorado well when we would go they had neighbors uh, next door that I didn't know from a handshake, but only a wave. We had never said hello to one another or nothing. We would just say hi. This year, uh, my son and I are in the backyard, and he's jumping up and down on a trampoline. I've got a Nerf football, and I'm throwing it to him, and he's catching it. And um, one of them, the quarterback, threw a really bad pass, and so it gets out past him and goes down a little bitty hill and kind of out into this field. When that happens, 
I turn and I look towards my sister's back door, so sliding glass doors. So I'm looking at that, all of a sudden, I'm standing there waiting for my son to come back. I look over here to the right at that neighbor's I was telling you about. I see the sliding glass door open and there's a little girl who's five years old. And she comes running out and she's screaming at me in, in this cutest voice and she says, Mr. 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 And she gets up to me and tugs on my, my shorts a little bit and she says, my name is Noah. And she says, I spell it N-O-A. She says, because girls don't spell it with an H. And I'm like, well, that's great. And so I'm looking at her and I'm like, so how are you? And she said, well, I'm doing good. But she said, I've come out here today because I'm supposed to sing you the Hebrew alphabet. And I look at her and I'm like, what? She said, yes, it's called the Olive Bet. And so she's like, can I? And I'm like, yeah. And so I'm just like overcome. She starts with this beautiful voice of a five-year-old singing to me the Hebrew alphabet. And I, it's another one of those moments with hair kind of going. And I'm standing there and tears are coming out. And I look, I look over at my son and his eyes are kind of like wide open. And my sister comes out and kind of looks at what's going on and, you know, it, it was just one of those moments. Well, that causes her mom to come out. So her mom comes out and she says, what's going on? And she looks and she's like, I'm singing in the olive bed, you know, da, da, da. And I said, I don't know what this is or what this means, but I said, it has everything to do with Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. And she loses it. She just starts bawling and she says, oh my God. She said, something just happened. She said, I've now received joy. And I'm like, okay. And she says, nothing to do with you, but whatever the Holy Spirit is doing and what you spoke, she said, for two years, we've been miserable. She said, we were in Israel. And she said, we were forced to come back because we couldn't make Aliyah yet. The Father said it wasn't time. And I was like, oh my God. So they were living there, you know, as a family. And he sent them back because it, I forget the name of the, uh, something around 2010 that happened over there. It starts with an H, but I can't remember. Forgive me. Anyway, um, that caused them not to be able to do the business they were doing. And so they were forced basically back to the United States. So anyway, um, she's telling me this while her brother comes down <coughs> and outside. And he's like, what's going on? You guys are sobbing and blah, blah, blah. And she says, he just mentioned Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. And he's like, you got to be kidding me. He said, I was just sitting upstairs looking out of a window at you guys. And I was reading that very scripture. So I'm like, oh my gosh, Father. I'm like, this is absolutely incredible. So it's either that Paige is really stubborn and slow. <laughs> he's got to do things like a hundred times. Or there was something that he was really wanting to emphasize. And I think it's probably both. But anyway, that was a beautiful thing. Well, that turns into uh, the doors opening for my next trip to Israel. And so um, she said, I really want to introduce you to my parents, who are Dennis and Tirza D. And they have a, a group, and you guys probably all know about them, but they have a, a ministry called Hands to the Land, where they take people over in the, the spring leadership, and then you have an opportunity. No, it's fall, and then spring, you get a chance to work, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So... Uh, but anyway, talking about that morning, so this was, on a, this was on a Wednesday when that happened. Well, I get invited Saturday morning to meet Dennis and Tirza and to spend the morning with their family having breakfast. So I show up, it's 9 o'clock, I'm sitting at one end of the table, Dennis is at the other after we've given our hellos. There's food, there's eggs, there's all this awesome food out on the table. Noah comes out and says hello and sits next to me. And anyway, she gets up and she walks around this table and she goes and she hops up into, hops up into her grandpa's lap. When she does that and I see those two embrace, it was like a light switch that went off in me. And it was like, oh my gosh. I said, this is what this is about. This is what you want your people doing. You want your people to celebrate the Sabbath. And I mean, I was, it was like four strings snapped from my neck and from my back. And it was like I was free for the first time since coming to the Father in the name of Jesus because I knew I didn't have to find another denomination. I didn't have to go seeking after another church. But more clearly, it's like, okay, yeah, I don't have to go back to church on a Sunday. I mean, it was just, he was bringing some things to clarity. So anyway, Dennis, I have a great time with that. Dennis afterwards uh, calls me a couple of days later and said, I've, I've had a vision. I was sweeping my front porch and she said, I saw you and another gentleman in Israel going house to house and you were doing ministry within a community. I'm like, okay. I said, well, that's easy because I, I know I was going back. Well, 
So here we are, overseas again, in Israel, and I'm so excited. I meet Dennis and Tirch that are there to greet me, and it's where I met Bill and Mary Ellen. We, we uh, what a wonderful relationship that has begun from that point, and divine, and it's the reason I'm here, actually. This is the connection to here, is you guys, so. Anyway, and then I got to met, meet Stephen and, and his brothers, and anyway, it's just been a great journey meeting all of you, of course, it's been wonderful, but. Uh, so we're over there, and I'm just going to jump to the to the end of the trip and get to the point where I can wrap this up. Gosh, it's noon already. Um, the very end of this trip, a lot of stuff happened that I can mention, but I need to get to this point because we ended up at the border of Lebanon and um, Israel at a place called Benias, and this is where the Temple of Pan would have been. This is near uh, where Nimrod's castle was constructed. And has everybody been there, pretty much, or seen it, or know what I'm talking about? Um, anyway, uh, the group I was with, it was important that we kind of all stay together. It was kind of one of the rules. We couldn't like veer off and go. Anyway, the father says, I'm going to require that you veer off on this one. And I did get out of the bus. And I didn't even go. I just did what he said to do. And so I veer off. And anyway, he says, I want you to go to the mouth of this cave. I don't know if you remember that or not. But anyway, I go to the mouth of this cave entrance of where this altar would have been set up, you know, to pan. And there's all kinds of... Uh, uh, literature and things that you can read about this place online. But I'm looking into this cave and where this altar would have been, and all of a sudden I go, the Father gives me a vision. And in this vision I see this tall dragon looking, kind of, it kind of has a dog face, it's got bull horns, it's ugly, it's about 10 feet tall, it's kind of a brownish tan stone, um, and anyway, it's, it's holding its arms out like this at about a 30 degree angle. And after I recognized what it was, and I knew it was Molech, and after I recognized who it was, um, all of a sudden I see dark-skinned people and their families, and they've got their firstborn. And I see them going up, and they're giving sacrifices to Molech. They're actually taking their newborn babies and actually setting, not even really setting, they were tossing because the fire was so hot on the arms of this false deity. And anyway, when that would happen, excuse the kind of, this is a little bit R-rated, but I would see kind of the skin of the babies separate, and I would see blood drop down into the, the river, and I would see the river going like that. Well, I mean, I couldn't take it. I saw this happen a couple of times, and I turn around, and I walk away, and I walk back out towards where we would have parked that day on that bus. And I get behind something because I'm kind of teared up and I just don't want people to see me. You know, I'm like, I, I need this time with the Father for a few minutes to kind of gather myself. And he does, and I just start asking, I'm like, why would you show me that? You know, what is that about? What, what's up with that? And anyway, he speaks to me and he says, you're guilty. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I've never done that. I've certainly never taken a newborn and placed it you know, in the arms of Molech. I said, that's not true. Well, immediately he reminds me of, in my secular life, how I helped someone that I was close to. It wasn't my child, but I actually walked hand in hand with them, supported them, and took them to an abortion clinic and walked them through the process of eliminating a life. So I was guilty of murder. And it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, that obviously tore me up from, from limb to limb. Well, what do you do with that? you know, other than repenting, you know, and I knew, I had already known and repented from that abortion. And I repented for the killing of a child, but I'd never had an opportunity to repent for worshiping that deity. So that door was open, you know, for the beginning of the process of the tearing down of paganism and the paganism structures in my generations, but particularly, you know, my life. So anyway, after I kind of get it together and I repent for that, he says, go back to the opening. And so I go back to the opening. And he speaks to me and he says, there's much more you need to repent of. He said, you've been worshiping false gods and false deities your entire life. And I'm like, I, I'm not sure I know what you mean. <laughs> but then he just rips them off. He starts saying it, Christmas, Easter, St. Patty's Day, Halloween. I mean, the, the whole gamut. And I mean, I'm just shaking my head and I'm like, wow, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you move forward with that? He was so gentle, as you guys know and experience, when he chastises us or, you know, he gets our attention. He was very gentle with me. And I said, well, I don't know what this looks like, Father, but I want to follow you. And if I've been walking in paganism my whole life, you know, please forgive me and, and show me the way to go. And he said, okay. And he said, do you realize that you have asked me who I am? He said, do you realize that you've asked me to show you my ways? Just like Moses. 
I saw that. I remember reading that scripture when Moses prayed that. I was like, oh, yeah, me too. I want to know you, Father. I want to know you in your ways. And he said, but now you're getting the understanding, son, that, you know, your fathers have inherited lies. And you have been preaching not on purpose to lead people astray, but it's because of ignorance and because of lack of knowledge that my people are destroyed. So that was kind of the beginning of the process. And he said, you have to go back to the beginning. So indeed I did. And he said, I'll teach you. And so he opened my eyes about the Sabbath. You know, he said, this is a sign between me and you forever. And it's a feast day. And so I start learning all these things. And then I call her the librarian. Mary Ellen sends me tons of books and information and support. And Father's just supported me in such a massive way through you. And I thank you and Bill and, and, and your family and resources and just but teaching because that whole thing has to be torn down and as you guys well know it's a, it's a, it's a death you grieve this process of what you go through and when you understand that you've been lied to your entire life it has to be dealt with so uh, anyway that process began well from that point Two things happened, basically, when I got back from this trip. And I said, what in the heck, you know, was going on? Why would you take me through this process? And it's just getting intense at this point. Well, the second I prayed that prayer, he takes me out of my body, my spirit, and all of a sudden I'm hovering above the earth. And I'm looking down at the earth, and I see this globe, and it's spinning, and I can see each country. Well, the globe stops when I'm actually looking at the United States of America here. I see Europe. I can see Israel, and I can see Africa. I see South America. I see Chile. And, all this, and I just knew that I was centered over when I was looking down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And I knew that that, for some reason, was important to see. So as soon as I recognize where I am, he drops me really fast. And I know that I'm hovering like three feet above the surface of these waters. Well, I'm looking at the Atlantic. All of a sudden, a, a sheet of paper about this size, probably it's an eight and a half by 11 um, sheet, and it was of thin tin. I knew the size was eight and a half by 11, and I knew that um, the sheet itself was tin. And all of a sudden, two white hands just come in, and I knew that they represented the Father's hands. Take this sheet of paper, crush it, and it drops in the water. Well, when it drops in the water, there's a major shift that takes place on the mid-Atlantic region. And I just, I, I knew that when that shift occurred, it didn't seem like it was a big deal right then, but I knew that it would have a global impact of whatever it meant. So, boom, I'm back in my body, just like that. I'm like, what in the heck just happened? You know, what was that? What does this mean? And uh, very quietly and gently he says, I am, um, I am destroying and crushing everything that's been man-made and fabricated. And I was like, ah, oh, man made it size, eight and a half by 11, 10. It's very easily, you know, it's fabricated. So he was crushing everything. He told me governmentally and religiously, he was going to begin to do a great work in establishing, you know, who he is in his ways. So I was like, right on. Also, before that trip, he told me to go to the airport and that he, there was a business card for me, finally. You know, and I'd, I'd never had him. I never had a card to pass out or anything. And he's like, I've got a card for you. So I get there and I go along the fence and sure enough, there's a business card. I call the name that's on the back of it thinking there's a divine appointment. Turn it over and flip it over. Well, it's the company Waste Management. You know, the garbage company, the yellow and the green, the W and the M. So I don't hear from him. I come back from Israel and I'm like, I didn't hear from, you know, this guy that whatever. And he said, it wasn't about you calling him or getting connected. And he said, go back to the airport. So I go back to the airport and I'm sitting in my spot and he said, pull out the card. So I pull out the card. He said, look at the front. And it says waste management. Well, he says to me, he says, waste management is the business that I'm in, and it's the business that I've called you to. And I was like, huh. I said, I'm going to start picking up garbage or something. You know, well, I'm fine with that. I'll, I'll do whatever. But he said, it isn't about tangible trash. He said, it's about people. And so this was the waste management of his people. This is about this picture, this walk that I have of him taking me out of this pagan worship mixed in with... Christianity to where I'm learning an understanding and still don't have it perfect. I'd need to learn so much, but getting a greater understanding what it's like to come out of Babylon and then into his way, starting to keep his Sabbath, you know, and his feasts. And I knew that that was a picture and a representation of what it says in Revelation 18:4. It says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sin and dwell in her plagues. That when we do that, that actually is the waste management. 
the devil has a sign. It's, it's, it's that marker. It's, it's the number of man, 666, and that sign will be upon the hand or it'll be on the, on the forehead. You know, the enemy has a sign. It's Babylon. It's being entrenched in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Father has a sign. It's called the tree of life. It's when we step into his ways, his purposes. His Sabbath is the sign, he says, that is between us and him forever. That's going to be the marker. Yes, the Messiah, the blood of Yeshua, that's necessary for salvation, and that's great. But to be part of the bride, I think there's some other stipulations, and I, we won't get into that today. I'm almost finished. Um, so the last eight years, I have been on the road, and uh, this is the first part of the journey, and I'm sure it will continue. I don't know what to degree, but the Father sent me to, to Native America, all over the United States, all over Canada, and uh, connecting to Israel. And I've absolutely seen amazing, amazing, amazing things. Just going, sharing what I just shared with you ignites something in the hearts of the people that he's stirring. It doesn't have anything to do with Paige. It's just sharing what he's doing supernaturally in my life through a testimony that by his Holy Spirit, he's igniting. He's turning things on inside of us to wake us up. He's turning things on to bring dreams, to bring visions, to recall things that are important, that are extremely important. So when I go and I share this message with the First Nations people, it's, it's in them. It's ingrained in them. I've never seen anything like when a First Nations person receives and they understand for the first time they have something they can grab onto that wasn't brought by a white man to kill them. I didn't have a blanket with a gift that had some disease like smallpox that took out 90%. It's somebody that would come and serve and, and, and stand alongside the Father's people, not looking to lead anybody, but yet lift them up, share his heart, but stand beside brothers and sisters and encourage them in the way and, and be a blessing and love and what that looks like, not, not coming in with an agenda and you know this whole 10 point plan of how to become a Hebrew roots follower. They've got it, that the Holy Spirit can ignite anything he wants at any time and I've seen it. And you guys know as well as I do when he cast uh, you know, Israel out, when he cast the 10 tribes out and scattered them across the globe, finding things all over the place, man. The Enchanted Rock down in New Mexico. There's people that know far and above, far more than I do, but just people that I've met that have found hieroglyphics. There's caves that are, that are uh, actually guarded by the FBI right now in the Navajo Nation in Arizona because there's Paleo-Hebrew in it. They don't, they don't want us to understand who we are. They don't want the nations, the First Nations people to understand who they are. They don't want African American people to know who they are. You know, you wonder, you look at this slavery and the killing. That Holocaust in 1942 or whenever that thing ended, that's nothing compared to what happened to the First Nations people or the African American people coming across the sea. That I don't, I can't say, I mean, it, it's awful what has happened, but there's a reason. And I say this today for anybody. I mean, the word says, choose today whom you're going to serve. Pick this day, whether you want blessings or if you want curses. The book of Deuteronomy talks about that. I, not only does Satan know what's happening, he can't create, he can mimic, but he knows his time is short. He knows who the Native American people are. He knows who we are. He knows who Israel is. And so he's doing any and everything he can to manipulate and destroy, steal, kill what the Father's plans are for bringing this tree of life, tree of life back into existence. I'm going to read some things to you here. We talked about the places of refuge. Um, the 45th parallel is really, really important. And I started having dreams about the 45th parallel and things that were going to be happening on the 45th parallel, both in the realm of destruction, particularly in the areas of Astoria, Salem, Portland, Seattle, and down that portion of I-5. But I-5, there are places of refuge all the way down to Mexico. Um, please keep that in mind. I'm just, I'm just saying this stuff. Um, the Chinese and the Russians, there's a lot going on with that. There's a guy named Henry Groover. If you want to get a real good understanding of maybe some things that could be coming um, in that area, Henry Groover is a wonderful, he's got a bunch of YouTube videos on that. He, he and I have had some parallel things, and I won't, I won't get into that stuff. 2016, I'm standing 
um, on top of a hotel roof in Zichron Yaakov, south of Haifa, about 30 minutes, and as I'm standing there, um, terrible fires started breaking out. I'm not saying because I was standing there, but it was during the time that a horrible fire was in Zikron Yaakov, and it was a time where like 55 of these fires were lit. If you guys remember, I think it was December of 16. Uh, but there's fires all over Israel, and Palestinians are lighting these things. And I'm praying, and I'm saying, Father, what's up? Trump, you know, has just been elected. He hasn't taken office yet. But I just said, what's happening? And he said, mark this day and mark this hour. He said, Pandora's box is open. And I'm like, oh, great. And I'm thinking the, the vision that I had was Pandora's box. If you're familiar with that on iPhone with songs or stuff like that, there's millions of genres. There's, there's, it's like rabbit holes all over the place. Darkness was going, he was going to allow darkness to come out at that time and at that point. Hey, he's God, I'm not. To begin to do things, to set things up, you know, for what's going to be happening closer to the end of days here. Um, just recently, and I'm going to go through just a few things here and then I'll stop. Uh, December of 2017, the Father brought me back out. In fact, it was, it was after the first time I was here. Is it December? Yeah, it was December. So I'm standing at the Columbia River, uh, my friend's place in Vantage, uh, Washington. I'm kind of kicking my feet around in the rocks, and all of a sudden the Father just speaks to me and he says, I'm eliminating the coup d'etat. I'm like, okay, I'm not sure what that means, but, you know, that's cool. And he says, I'm beginning the teardown that I'm showing you. He said, that crushing is beginning to take place of that thin tin. And he said, darkness is rising at a pace that no one can even comprehend. But he said, so is my goodness. And so is my power. He's allowing some things to take place and happen because he's setting it up. You know, but as Psalm 2 says, why do the nations rage? You know, he sits up there on his throne and he laughs. You know, he, he laughs at him. When he told me to look it up, I open it up. And if you look up coup d'etat, the first picture that comes out is the French Revolution. And you see on it a woman standing there holding the flag and she's breasted. She's not covered by bra or anything. And the father spoke to me and said, this is the whore of Babylon rising to its final spout, to its final stance, or in its final stance. And then again, I already said that, the teardown of the government and religious systems have began, but they have to rise first. So then he speaks to me that same day, and he says, I want to meet with you at ancient Shiloh at 1.17 uh, p.m. on 1.17. I'm like, wow, okay, so I write that down, and I just pray, and sure enough, it comes to pass that I have tickets to go to Israel. And uh, to meet with him at Shiloh. I was supposed to rendezvous with the Lutz family there, but it didn't, it didn't work out. I was only there five days. So um, when I'm there, I meet with my friend David that's in Shiloh. I have a spot there, and I just start to pray. I'm there a day early. And I get to ancient Shiloh, and it was amazing because it poured all morning. I mean, it rained so much that there were puddles. And what was great about that is it was going to give me, at least at 1.17, because it didn't stop raining until 12.30, it was going to give me time to be there alone with him before the tour buses. And if you've been to Shiloh, you know it's out in the middle of Samaria, and you, know, you can't just hop in your car and take 10 minutes and just go. So I knew I was going to have like an hour and a half with him there. So I go and I get there. Well, as I start praying at 117, he speaks to me and he says, will you do all that I require of you, no, no matter how difficult it is? And this also took place back in 2011, the first time that I was there. Um, I said, of course I will. You know, but the first time that he spoke, he said, will you do what I ask of you, uh, no matter how difficult it is? This time he said, will you do what I require? You know of you and I knew that specifically that there were going to be instructions that we had to have and he spoke and he said I'm releasing uh, Israel's inheritance to accomplish the vision that I've placed in their hearts and so I say that because I want to encourage you that whatever it is that the father has called you to do or to be a part of there's going to be greater activity supernaturally to help us in fact he said I'm going to be sending Gabriel you know, and the angelic host. And it was like, you know, in Daniel's day, if you remember, he was crying out in prayer and he needed understanding. And it's like, the Father's given me some pretty intense stuff. And I know he's given you guys a lot too. And it's like, maybe we don't, I know I don't, but we need to have supernatural understanding to move forward and to carry through with the vision that he's given. So I was thanking him for that. Um, 
All right, briefly, I'm just going to I'm just going to say this and then end. Um, the coup d'etat, the AK Babylon, um, the great harlot, the anti-Messiah is rising up and rising up in a fashion, in a way, and at a speed that we can't see. There's so much going on behind the scenes that we don't yet understand or know. Do you guys remember when Sophia came out, the artificial intelligence, the robot? She's now a citizen of Saudi Arabia. She's being used big time to create this Bitcoin system, you know, this cryptocurrency that is generating. And there's people all over the world who are deceived right now who are setting up computers. And through their personal computers, they're allowing artificial intelligence to calculate numbers which generate Bitcoin and currency, which is not good. Right now, governments are making decisions not based on wisdom from above, but they're getting information based on what they're plugging into artificial intelligence. They're making decisions for their countries right now based upon what a computer is telling them and not the spirit of yod heh -Hey. People are making decisions in their own lives. And so I just, I have to tell you this, two things left. I was recently in Lancaster, California, and the Father gave me a dream, and I was actually hovering over Facebook and Google. And when I was looking at it, I knew that in this dream he spoke to me and he said, this is social distortion. And he said, communities, false, fake communities are being created, and he said, it's a drug. I came out of that and I'm like, I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm on Facebook. But I noticed myself, have you ever been driving down the road and realized that you've forgotten your phone and then the reaction you have once you realize you don't have it? You freak out. I don't know if you, I do. I mean, there's been times where I freak out and it's like, I gotta go back. I don't care if I'm late for work. My phone takes precedence over what my boss would ever say. Think about the community. Think about that. Think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is one tree. And then you've got the tree of life. So you've got the antithesis of what the Father wants versus Him and what He wants. We have got to get much smarter. We've got to become a lot more aware because there are things being put out into the air that you and I know of subconsciously that's trying to control who you are. There's things happening right now in the 4G realm that are nothing compared to what's about to happen when this 5G activity comes out. That's why this Sabbath is so important. That's why the feast is one of the reasons. That's why it's important to begin to eat healthy. Get away from the things that put markers. I mean, I can't tell you that the, the TV shows that we watch, the very songs that we sing, they mark our DNA because your body remembers everything. That's why the blood of Messiah is so important because it erases all that stuff on our DNA that's accumulated generationally but then also with choices and decisions that we make on a daily basis. And it could be anything. I had a dream that um, I was looking at a foundation and it was marble. And I saw A, capital A period, and the last name Crowley. And I woke up from that dream in a panic because I knew the foundation with the Apaches, the A. Crowley Foundation with a chicken foot that was imprinted in it, was the antithesis to what the Father was revealing to me. And again, Paige, I'm, 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 that doesn't matter. We are getting ready to step into a war that we have never, where we have never been. I'm not giving the enemy props and I'm not giving him credit because it's just, it's a fact right now that where we are currently in America, in an apathetic and complacent society, the Father's going to allow things to get to a point where He's going to take those things away. He is going to eliminate and He's going to remove the things that keep us from Him. It's not something like this is new. This has happened over and over and over and over throughout the course of history and throughout the Bible. America, America's God right now, I, I would say, is not yod heh vav -Hey. There's people right now that trust President Trump more than they do him. They're looking to Trump as a savior instead of him. He's going to use that Cyrus. He's going to use that to bring about the purposes for Israel and America. 
but it's time we started partnering with him. There's artificial intelligence right now that is... <laughs> Their whole thing with, with, so the Aleister Crowley, let me go back there real quick. Aleister Crowley was the son of a minister. They were part of the uh, Quaker movement. And they were very religious, so very performance driven. And I wouldn't assume there was a whole lot of love. Everything that you did was based performancely, and that was about the relationship. It was all performance driven. Sorry, I keep moving, Nick. Um, he wanted to, and it says, in quote, with what he wrote, he said that he wanted to do the most debaucherous of sin. He wanted to be Satan's right-hand man. He wanted to bring about the greatest and darkest evils that this world has ever taken place. And it was out of just a hatred that he had for God. How that got put there, I, mean, I don't know. But this is, this is a human being, right? So he was key. He's the guy that created tarot cards. He's the guy that had a plan moving forward that the youth would be attacked. Um, this was 1940s before he died. He was big into getting things like uh, the messages that the Beatles put out. So this is all music. So you have to think of, would somebody please turn to uh, Ezekiel 28:18, please. Ezekiel 28:18. I don't have mine open. Um, prior to everything falling apart, if you can go here with me for a minute, would yeah, would you read that out, Stephen? Yes. You defile your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst; it devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you. Thank you. So in other words, what this is saying is that the father was chastening Satan as he was kicking him out, saying that not only was he responsible for all the music that was created in worship, but he obviously had sanctuaries that he was a part of and over. You have to think about that. And I just I, I ask you to seek the father about that because I think that's a critical piece to what we're going to have in warfare moving forward. There's a song that Ozzy Osbourne sings called Mr. Crowley. There's prophetic stuff that rock and roll bands have been putting out for years, and this has been part of that sinister system. The whole Illuminati thing, this whole one world order, you know, that's coming, this whole cryptocurrency, everything. You're going to have sanctuary cities that, you know, are being protected, like Oakland, in different places that are, they're not going to become state, they're going to become city states instead of part of states of a bigger whole. It's going to be city states. So you're going to have nine or eight or nine different places, maybe in California, that have its own rule. I mean, anyway, it's just, it, it's going there. There's a global currency. There's a global government. The reason that I'm saying all of this to you is that it's happening at a pace that we can't fathom and that we can't understand. And it's, it's the, the antithesis to what the enemy wants is the father establishing his Melchizedek priesthood in function again. And this is very, please ask the Father about this. The priests, it says in Hebrews, I mean, the Father's talked about it. We are priests, the order of Melchizedek, you know, as Yeshua is. Divinely, I believe the Father is wanting to give his people opportunities, assignments to where we actually are taking what it is that he's saying and going into the courtrooms of heaven. I believe supernaturally taking things like Donald Trump, if he gives you a dream about Donald Trump, or he tells you about human trafficking, or whatever it is, presenting these cases as an attorney would, you know, before the king of kings, he is our attorney, and before this divine counsel and those things operating, there's a scripture that says that this earth is groaning and crying out for the sons of God or man to be, to be manifested. It, it's waiting for us to be divinely in place, I believe, as priests, walking and functioning in that order. And the last thing that I want to say is, um, now is the time. The time now is, you know, that, that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And for the most part, the messianic movement, they're doing a great job in the truth part, but somehow we've either left behind or we're not including the Holy Spirit in a whole lot of what we're doing. This is a supernatural walk we have with supernatural expectancy that we should have. Supernatural encounters. 
with heaven and supernatural assignments. I mean, the Messiah, again, he said, you will see and do greater things than when I was here on this earth. Peter's shadow would have gone by Lynn and she would have been healed immediately. How come that's not happening? What did Yeshua do on the Sabbath? He did more than just go to the synagogue. He was walking through the fields with his disciples. He was healing people. What are we doing in the communities? What are we doing to touch people's lives? It's like, it's like this has become an all-inclusive thing. I'm not coming against you guys. I'm talking about as a whole. The Sabbath has been this little tucked away thing where we eat and drink and it's become inclusive. It's like, okay, well, what are we doing? Why aren't we out in the streets evangelizing? Why aren't we going laying hands on the sick and they be healed? Feeding the hungry. I mean, the very things that Yeshua said and we're going to be asked. He said, did you come visit me when I was in prison? Did you give me clothing when I was cold? Did you feed me when I was hungry? I'm not saying you're not doing that. I'm just, this is stuff that we need to think about, you know, as people. And so it's great. It's amazing to keep the Sabbath. It's amazing to keep his feast. It's amazing to get knowledge and understanding. There's a spiritual side to this, though. Power of the Ruach HaKodesh that is so necessary in what it is, and we're going to need it. We're going up against... I'll just I'll leave it there. Father, thank you for this time. I lift up every word that was spoken, Father, and, and I pray, Father, that you would bring uh, revelation and insight to me and to anybody that listens to this, Father. I, I humbly submit everything that was spoken to you, anything, Father, that was not of you, I pray you would remove, throw to the ground, that it would become null and void. Anything, Father, that is from you and that is truth, I thank you for bringing confirmation and I thank you for bringing life to it. Wake us up, Father. Remove the apathy and complacency, Father, that's in our hearts and in our lives, in our midst, in our congregations, in our families. Show us the strategies, Father. Give us the blueprints that we need to move forward to have success as a community. Thank you for John 17. I pray for the unity, Father, of all of yours. And that we could act and that we could function. That we could actually function as a body in the order of Melchizedek. We love you and give you praise in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you.